Okay, let's get started. We're a little after the hour. It's 10.01 Central Time and a warm welcome from Nashville, Tennessee, home of Vanderbilt University. Uh, my name is Dave Goodridge, your moderator for today's webinar. I'm also the Director of Custom Programs here at Vanderbilt Exec Ed. We welcome you. This is our second of four webinars we are doing with the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. We also have a webinar next Tuesday on emotional intelligence. If you'd like to learn more about that, uh, please email me or, or Andy. We also have information at the end of the, the webinar uh, once we get started. We'll wait a couple more minutes. Um, some housekeeping, this program is being recorded this morning. So if you'd like to send it on to those colleagues who haven't had a chance to join this morning, it will be recorded and will be sent out to those registered for the program. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Zoom, we, we're, we will make today's session interactive. We encourage you to pop in questions into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And also there will be plenty of time for Q&A at the conclusion of our program. So it's a couple minutes after the hour and we'll get started. We have a packed morning full of programming for you. We wanna make it as interactive as possible. Once again, my name is Dave Goodridge, your moderator for this morning, Director of Custom Programs here at Vanderbilt Business School. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Vanderbilt Exec Ed is the non-degree part of the business school. That is, we offer the world-class programming that our MBAs, executive MBAs get in a non-degree format. We offer programs around executive leadership, strategic decision-making, innovation, and many, many more. At the end of this, this webinar today, we'll have uh, some contact information for you and a link to our website so you can peruse and choose uh, the type of programming that best suits your needs. We also have programming for organizations wishing to do a custom program. So a little bit about this morning. We wanna make it as interactive as possible once we get started. The, I encourage you to pop in questions into the, into the Q&A function that we can get to at the end. We'll also have, we'll try to mimic the classroom as best as we can. We'll ask for suggestions of company names, industries, or ideal industries that you want uh, the professor to tackle this morning. So again, a warm welcome from, from Nashville. Uh, this is being recorded and we'll get started. So before we get started, I wanna turn it over to um, Ralph Schultz. Ralph, if you wanna unmute yourself, there you are. Ralph uh, is a uh, president and CEO of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. We partner with the chamber on several of these webinars to help share with those in the local business community. We have many joining outside of the Nashville area, uh, but Ralph, thanks again for your partnership and it's all yours. Dave, thank you. Uh, we're excited about this partnership and welcome to everyone. Um, we created this next normal webinar series to help businesses, the business community plan for the reopening and restoration of the economy. And as you all know, as of yesterday, Metro has now moved into phase three of Mayor Cooper's phased reopening plan. So uh, we have just another layer of business activity that we'll now be, in, be able to undertake. I think one of the great things about Nashville is we saw in the flood and we saw in the uh, recession that in these times of economic uh, uh, crisis and opportunity, uh, Nashville always reemerges on the other side of these, these events uh, even stronger. And you are right on the front lines of doing that. Uh, we're thrilled today to be partnering with Vanderbilt Executive Education. I just wanna say that uh, their presentations here are always meaty, they are concise, and they are news that you can use. And uh, we've had a long-standing relationship. In fact, I've actually undertaken their uh, executive uh, training over at Vanderbilt as well, found it to be really, really helpful. Today, we're excited to hear from Professor Andy Van Schack. Um, today's webinar is about predicting and planning for the future. Uh, would direct any of you that are looking for economic forecasting for the mid-state to the Nashville Chamber website. We've actually projected out for the next two years. So you might find some of that information to be helpful to your business planning. But we know as you're looking at how to navigate our new normal, that being proactive during uncertainty is gonna be key to the economic rebound. And so we'll continue to be your partners on the front lines. But Dave, now back to you, because I know people are eager to get the information. Thanks, Ralph, and we appreciate your partnership. All right, Professor Andy Van Schack, a little intro about him. I've gotten to know him quite well over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Professor Andy Van Schack is, uh, has a dual appointment here at Vanderbilt, both at the School of Engineering and the Peabody College of Education. 
when we choose our professors that teach to our executive audience, we want them to have the mastery of content area, but also the real world experience. Um, Andy's worked at Apple, uh, both in Cupertino, California and Tokyo. Uh, he's been, he actually has earned 15 patents already granted and pending for inventions. Uh, most relevant, and, and I'm pleased to report that in 2017, uh, Andy was the recipient of the Madison Surratt Prize for Excellence in Teaching. It's basically uh, the best teacher on campus. So um, we've got a packed morning this morning. Uh, Andy, let's get it started. Thanks, Dave, for that uh, very generous introduction. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you for this uh, invitation. Uh, what I thought we'd do is start off with a little bit of information about what technology foresight is. Uh, what is this field of technology forecasting? And as promised in the invitation, we're going to be covering four methods for technology forecasting. Monitoring, expert opinion, and specifically the Delphi method, trend extrapolation, and then finally scenario development. At the end, I'll sort of wrap them up and, and talk about how we can combine these forecasts, these methods for using quantitative and qualitative information to make predictions about the future to allow us to prepare ourselves for it. And as you pointed out, well, there will be plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. And I look for, um, that's one of my favorite parts of being a teacher, Dave, is, is hearing the questions that students have and, and having this discussion about um, the content that was presented today. Terrific. Um, let's get start. Let's get kick off this session with a polling question for all of you in attendance. It should pop up on your screen now. And the question is, which of these industries has the greatest need for technology forecasting? So start putting in your answers. We'll wait till we get a decent number. We're about 40%. Pretty evenly split. I'm going to wait till we get to just over 70%. There we go. We've got 70% of you recording. I'm going to end the polling now and share the results. Can you see on your screen, Andy? Healthcare is leading. It's pretty evenly split, about 43%. Uh, education follows 28%, and then manufacturing and transportation, 14%. So, Andy. Comments. What can you what can you take from this? We're obviously in, in maybe biased with the healthcare response, but um, can you can you opine as to the, the the answers to these this question? I think I suspect, as you just said, that uh, the majority or many of the participants on this webinar are from the Nashville area, we're the healthcare capital of the country, so it doesn't surprise me that that's represented well. Uh, manufacturing and transportation are in in there. Uh, education, of course, is very important. I think all of us are thinking about. Um, what is the future of education, especially considering what's happening with COVID? And that's on all of our minds. Uh, I think what, uh, no matter what we put up there, Dave, whether it was finance or it could have been uh, high tech or it could be agriculture, uh, one of the interesting points, and this is what I get from teaching this graduate level course with people who have such varied interests, is there's an application to forecasting for any industry that you could name. So good stuff. Um, I'd like to start this presentation with the end, at least the end of the courses that I teach at Vanderbilt. The final exam question and the final final exam question is this. What technology do you think will change the world as much in the next 25 years as computers and the internet have over the last 25? And I'm hoping students on the final exam will actually have some really great answers that I can learn from. And what I'm asking them to do, and I'm asking you to do, is to think back to 1995, right? So this image on the very left, we see this, uh, this guy who's obviously in a technology. He's got a, a video camera, a boom box. He's got a VHS recorder, a Walkman. These are all the kinds of technologies that we had 25 years ago. All of those now are wrapped up and they're in our pockets or our purses or our bags in the form of a cell phone which does more than just allow you to call people. It allows you to play games, to navigate, uh, to search for information on the internet. And that's pretty remarkable. I think it's tough for all of us to live without that, but project yourself into the year 2045. 25 years from now, what technology will change the world as much as computers and the internet have over the last 25? That's what I enjoy thinking about. Now it could be robots. And in this particular image, we have the two-legged and four-legged variety. And it's remarkable uh, the advancements in robotic technology. 
with battery density, uh, onboard computing and sensing systems, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, if you put robots into vehicles, you have autonomous vehicles. And I think we've seen uh, what Tesla has done, but just about every manufacturer has some form of an autonomous vehicle. And that, those vehicles will also be flying. Uh, Uber has a relationship with Hyundai and they'll, they'll be developing electric vertical and takeoff and landing aircraft that will have a lot of these autonomous systems aboard. Obviously virtual and augmented reality systems are pretty amazing. And more than just immersing yourself in the environment, we can map that environment onto your glasses. So you can combine computer generated and real images. Synthetic biology used to be my answer to the question, the idea that we can take DNA and slice and dice it and recombine it to create new types of fuel and foods and pharmaceuticals, even life extension, genetic trait selection. Reusable rockets are pretty exciting. The idea of being able to launch uh, products into orbit much more cheaply than we ever could before. Blockchain, which many of you may have heard about, especially as it relates to Bitcoin, but this idea that we don't need to have trusted intermediaries anymore with some form of a centralized ledger. We can actually have individuals communicate with each other in a very secure fashion for all forms of commerce. Artificial intelligence is pretty exciting. The idea that our computers can perceive the environment. They can comprehend what is being said to them because they can tap into their knowledge database and then they can take action, learning from the environment and acting on it. And current forms of artificial intelligence are things like Amazon's Alexa, we've got the Echo Dot here. Uh, we also have Siri on your iPhone, but IBM Watson is probably the most sophisticated commercial AI system that's available today. And they're just going to get more and more sophisticated as we move forward. So Dave, let's ask this question. What technology do you think will change the world as much in the next 25 years as computers and the internet have over the last 25? So if you would please type your answer into the chat feature. Terrific, we've got AI, obvious, another one AI. CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, battery technology, visual recognition tech, AI, bioelectronics, more AI, robotics, electrical vehicles, uh, blockchain, immort immortality, <laughs> thank sure. you, Jose, uh, quantum <laughs> computing, Michael, blockchain, biopharma uh, from Todd, thank you, synthetic bio. So we're, we're seeing synthetic bio, AI, quantum computing, um, right. keep them coming. Andy, yeah, and those are, the kind of, those are the kind of answers I expect. I think artificial intelligence is pretty exciting, this idea that our computers can be as smart as us, perhaps within our own lifetime. And those technology, that technology will allow us to create all of these others that you're mentioning. Synthetic biology, genetic engineering, CRISPR is the foundational technology that allows for that slicing and dicing of DNA. I love that somebody mentioned battery technology, power density for electric aircraft. Um, batteries are pretty important because they power all these electronic devices. Some people may have mentioned Internet of Things, the idea that we can put microprocessors into everything around us to help create a more advanced civilization of sorts. Anything else you want to mention, Dave? That's um, it's a asteroid mining and Hyperloop. Uh, thank you, Roman, for that one. <laughs> yeah, asteroid mining may produce our first trillionaire if they can actually lasso one of these asteroids full of rare earth minerals. That won't be so rare if they can get it into orbit and bring it down. But what's fun about the uh, technology forecasting course that I teach at the graduate level and at a program that Dave and his organization would produce is you would come in and pick a technology that you're interested in and then apply the different methods of forecasting to it. And so it's not like the homework assignments or the activities within the class are about technologies I'm interested in. You could do it related to something that you have a personal interest in or professional interest. So these are the four methods for forecasting we're gonna talk about today. Monitoring, expert opinion, the Delphi method, trend extrapolation, and scenarios development. And as I pause here real quick, I want to, everyone, we got great usage of the, of the chat function. Um, we're going to treat this like a classroom as if Andy were calling on you. So if you would please type into chat your uh, company name, if you're not comfortable with the name, an industry, perhaps it best represents your company, or just an industry that you want Andy to talk, talk about. As we go through these four uh, methods, monitoring expert opinion and trend extrapolation, scenario development, I'll pick on one of those and we'll, we'll actually tackle in real time. So in chat, again, pop in your company name, 
uh, we've got some ones coming in, so we got plenty. Keep them coming throughout, and I'll call on a couple of these as we get started. So let's get far started with the first one, um, Andy, monitoring. Yeah. Sure. One of my favorite quotes is by William Gibson. He's a science fiction author who sort of is a pioneer of the cyberpunk genre. He wrote, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And that's really the foundational um, idea behind monitoring, the idea that any type of technology that will exist in the future exists in some form today. We just need to find it in its very nascent stages. The stages of technological development start off with scientific findings. Somebody finds some new material or some principle of physics or some new chemical property of a material. And based on that scientific finding, they start to monkey around with it in the laboratory. They see what it can do. They see how it can be controlled ultimately to solve some problem. And they develop solutions to problems in the form of products or devices or again, materials. And they develop some sort of a prototype Oftentimes, if this research is done in a university setting, they work with their tech transfer office and find some sort of a commercialization partner. And they bring that product out to the market, sometimes with a beta test, uh, and then ultimately it receives wider adoption. Then there's diffusion of that technology to other areas that the original inventor never anticipated. If you think about laser technologies, and initially they would use just to shine light and use as a pointing device, but then ultimately they're used for range finding and these autonomous vehicles. They're used for reading and writing to media like CD-ROMs. Um, they're also used in surgery. So we see technologies diffuse into other areas. And then ultimately, uh, researchers uh, and other historians examine the social and economic impact of those technologies. So science leads to products and through engineering and then ultimately through commercialization and business activities. And these stages of technological development start with basic science and move all the way through everyday life. The principle behind monitoring is recognizing that at each stage of technological development, there are channels of distribution of information associated with them. So as we move from basic science to everyday life, we can look for information about technologies, uh, sometimes with funding agencies, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, National Institutes of Health, Department of Education, many types of governmental organizations fund scientific research. A lot of research into new technologies comes from uh, venture capital firms, and there's a number of companies like Venture Scanner who track that funding and see where those new companies are that are starting up. That's a great way to find out where new technologies are. R&D labs all around the country, all around the world, like at Vanderbilt University, tens of thousands of groups of people just like this who are conducting research. And they wanna make those research findings known to the public. Um, those researchers could also be in commercial organizations, whether it be telecom, finance, entertainment, uh, computing technology, aviation, health. Every organization that's large has an R&D function. And many of those R&D organizations publish their findings early. Sometimes they have conferences. Tesla had an autonomy day last year. Uh, their battery Dave is, uh, day is coming up, Dave, on September 15th, I think, with their earnings call. And that's gonna be very exciting. Somebody had mentioned battery technology. I think they're gonna have some very exciting things to say. I'll be tuning into that one. There are a variety of competitions. I don't know if you've heard of the X Prize, but DARPA, NASA, and other governmental organizations have competitions to incentivize uh, research groups, whether they be private or public or just individuals to try to solve really interesting problems. New things happen as a result of that. A lot of academic research appears in uh, journals and there are tens of thousands of journals. For anything you're interested in, I guarantee there is some academic journal that publishes it. The best play way to get access to this if you're not in academia is through Google Scholar. So just Google, Google Scholar. And when you type in a search term, you'll get immediately to some really good uh, high quality results. And then patent database. I don't know if you know this, but when you file a patent, that patent is published within 18 months in the United States. And so oftentimes it takes companies longer than 18 months to bring products to market. So I don't know if you remember Dean Kamen had invented this new type of transportation device. And there were a lot of rumors about this product codenamed Ginger. Well, Dean Kamen's patent was published in December 2000, as you can see on the picture on the left, and then ultimately a year later was actually uh, announced on television in Good Morning America. Um, and so 
the patent publication preceded the public announcement by a year. You can look at the patent database to discover new technologies that you'll be seeing on the marketplace in months or years to come. And then finally, Dave, there are white papers and media. Uh, I like MIT's technology review, but there's many others, IEEE Spectrum, and then um, even more type uh, consumer publications like uh, Wired have really interesting uh, information about technologies. But all of those things that you read about in this type of media appeared in these other sources months and many years before they appeared in this form of press. Thank you, Andy, for that, for that section on the first uh, forecasting methods and monitoring. So I've had a ton. Thank you so much for your, your input here. We've got a lot to choose from. I won't be able to get to all of them. We only have four. Um, I'm gonna, I saw a bunch in the finance and banking sure. area. Uh, I right. know it's a toughie because of which I, what I see on the screen is a lot of um, sort of tangible techie stuff. But can we look at uh, finance and, and banking as in the monitoring uh, forecasting method? Yeah, so just um, talking about that, a lot of the innovations in finance, you know, the one that you had uh, picked up on earlier, like blockchain or Bitcoin, are going to have tremendous impacts on finance, anything that has to do with telecommunication. I had mentioned the idea about um, reusable rockets and SpaceX being able to send satellites up into orbit much uh, less expensively than with current technologies. Uh, Elon Musk, one of his companies, is creating a new technology called Starlink. Starlink will send tens of thousands of satellites in the orbit, reducing latency uh, between two um, parts of the globe. And if you're into trading and you want to take advantage of arbitrage and the difference is low latency is a really important thing. But many of these mobile technologies, I think, will have impact on finance. Um, and I think you can read uh, about new technologies as they affect um, finance through any of these types of uh, media. Terrific. I'm going to tee up uh, as we go into the next stage, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is Delphi method. Sure. Um, I'm going to give you um, another example, which is hospitality. So All right. that's an industry near and dear to Nashville. Let's look at uh, hospitality as we look at the second method. Sure. And I think that one's perfect, Dave. Thank you. Uh, the second method of technology forecasting is called the Delphi method. And here's a quote from James Sirowicki, who wrote a book that you may be familiar with called The Wisdom of Crowds. He wrote, paradoxically, the best way for a group to be smart is for each person in it to think and act as independently as possible. And it is paradoxical, but I'll explain why that is. The problem is there is a problem with expert opinion. There's a great book by Dan Airely called Predictably Irrational. And I use it as for one of my courses on judgment and analytical reasoning. Um, this idea that we as human beings uh, have forms of cognitive illusions, ways that we don't understand or can't process information from the environment correctly. So the problem with expert opinion is who's an expert, right? Just because you have a PhD after your name or CPA or um, just because you've done something for a long period of time doesn't make you necessarily um, the best source of information. Experts can be wrong and oftentimes are wrong in their predictions or their understanding of the world. Experts can and often do disagree with each other. And so many of us consumers or just people in the public are kind of confused. One expert says one thing, another says something else. Who can I believe? Experts are subject to biases because they're human beings. They're subject to the same cognitive illusions that you and I are. Um, just because they're an expert doesn't mean they can't be confused. And finally, groups of experts have even more biases, this idea of groupthink and one person in the group leading others towards their idea of thinking. So what's needed is a way of gathering the collective knowledge of experts uh, without some of the downsides associated with focus groups. And so back in 1951, the United States government in a project called, a uh, program called Project Delphi uh, developed a way to do this. And here's a quote from their first report. The Delphi method was devised in order to obtain the most reliable opinion consensus of a group of experts by subjecting them to a series of questionnaires in depth interspersed with controlled opinion feedback. And that's certainly a mouthful. And I'll explain what that actually means by going through um, the steps in just a moment. In this particular report from 1951 that was later declassified in 1962, uh, the experts were asked to take the viewpoint of a Soviet strategic planner. They were asked, how many atomic bombs would be required to reduce the munitions output of the United States to 25% of what it would have been, right? So this is just after World War II was complete, nuclear weapons were new, and nobody had any idea how many nuclear weapons the Soviet Union had. So in this first round, if you see down here in the bottom left-hand corner of this graph, 
in the first round, the range of opinions were as many as 5,000 to as few as 50. But you'll notice through multiple rounds, and that's one of the characteristics of Delphi, there was this convergence from about 100 to 1 down to 2 to 1. Uh, the experts were able to narrow down their estimates to one that was represented the best consensus of that group. And so here's how the Delphi four round process works. And Dave, you asked me to talk about hospitality. Delphi would be great for hospitality. It's a method for technology forecasting where uh, what, so what society thinks, uh, ethical issues, social issues may influence what happens in the future. And certainly with something like COVID-19, it's very difficult to look at trends in the past and project in the future because nothing like COVID-19 and the lockdowns we've seen have happened in the past. So the Delphi method would be a great way to get expert opinion from people associated with the hospitality industry, but again, without some of the downsides associated with groupthink and focus groups. So Dave, let me take you and, and everyone else through this four round process. Uh, this would be something that you could do. You're the moderator, and so you identify a theme and you recruit experts. You say, we'd like to know what the future of the hospitality industry is uh, in the next two years. Uh, we don't know, so we're gonna get some experts from the hospitality industry to help us out. You identify those experts, and you ask them to identify events associated with the theme. Uh, when theme parks are going to open up again, when we're gonna see organized athletic events and large outdoor indoor venues, when are cruise ships going to be at 80% capacity? You let your experts decide what questions they're going to, or what dates they're going to predict. Then you as a moderator consolidate those events and then you distribute a questionnaire. So you take all of those ideas, just like you're doing with the Q&A, Dave, and you're consolidating it down into just a few events that you ask them to predict. The experts forecast a date for each event and send it to you. And then your job is to run statistics and send the results to experts. So you're looking at the median date. What is the average, uh, essentially? You're looking for outliers. What's really at the high end of the estimates and at the low end of the experts? You send that data back out to the experts and they can update their estimates. Now, if they're an outlier, they have to explain why they're an outlier. The moderator runs the statistics again, recognizing that some people are going to update their uh, estimates based upon what other people are estimating, but the information that they're sharing with each other. And they send them out again with those new explanations. The experts can update their estimates one final time, uh, uh, explaining their outliers once again, and then the moderator provides a final report to everyone. So the key concepts of the Delphi method are a panel of experts. It's your job to pick a dozen or so individuals who you think have a diverse perspective on whatever you're interested in. So if it's hospitality, it could be somebody from hotels, somebody from entertainment, somebody who is an entertainer, or somebody, people from the public who, um, uh, take advantage of a lot of these uh, hospitality venues. Get a panel of experts, uh, send out to them an anonymous questionnaire as I described, provide them with feedback and statistical analysis, and then iterate through multiple rounds to get convergence on a final response. So Delphi would be an excellent approach for hospitality or other areas where there's a lack of historical data, uh, where the trends are changing or where social and ethical issues dominate. Terrific. We are uh, halfway through. Our next method, trend forecasting, um, is we've got a unique one. I don't want to stump you, but I kind of do. Architecture. Okay. Architecture. Let's, let's look at architecture as we go through trend forecasting. Sure. And my uh, son is interested in studying architecture in college, so I've had some conversations with him about this. Let's see how we can do. All right, trend forecasting. Uh, here's a great quote from Jim Barksdale, the former Netscape CEO, said, if we have data, let's go with that. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. And wouldn't that be something that your boss might say to you? If we're all sitting around the table sharing our opinions, well then the, the person whose opinion counts most, probably the CEO of the company is gonna say, we're just gonna use mine. But if you wanna to contribute to the conversation and steer it in the way that you think makes sense, having data is really valuable. So where the monitoring approach and Delphi are, think of them as more qualitative methods, trend forecasting is very kind of hardcore quantitative and you can provide data to those decision makers to make better decisions. 
Uh, here's a picture of a cow and a cow on a scale. That would have been tough to get them up on that and sit still for a moment. But imagine taking the weight of a cow over time, over its, its uh, early life, and you would find some data that looks just like this. Now, if you're good with Excel, you could do a curve fit and say, here is a growth curve for this cow. But I'm betting it's going to be close to the growth curve for all other cows like this one. And so you could use a curve like this to make a prediction about some other cow in the future. And that's where trend forecasting really came from, the idea of growth curves, whether it be for cows or for animals or growth of market share. We see a variety of curves. Here's an example of an exponential growth pattern. We see this in the cumulative installed rate of photovoltaic cells, right? As solar cells become less expensive over time, in fact, their cost of solar cells are decreasing exponentially in their dollars per watt the installed base is increasing exponentially. And so going with that theme, Dave, of architecture, this idea of having solar cells mounted on the roof or even creating a roof out of solar cells is a trend that you could watch as the cell pr price comes down. This is something that you might want to offer to the person that you're building uh, a residential home for or making uh, recommendations for people in commercial real estate. Is that a stretch? I thought it was okay. Uh, uh, it's, 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 if, you're pro if you want to put solar energy into your, your house, yes. For, for a lot of people, it's still a, a nice to have. There you go. Uh, here's one that's called a logistic curve. Um, and this one happens to be propeller driven aircraft speed. And I like this one because what it shows is when you start off with the Wright brothers and you move through to World War II, the speed of propeller driven aircraft increased initially exponentially. All exponential or all logistic curves or S shaped curves, see the shape of the letter S there, start off with exponential growth. Many people would like to believe they're going to continue exponentially forever, but there's some sort of limiting factor with almost every exponential function. And so that's what the case is here. Tip speed of propellers reaching the speed of sound. And that's what really limits the speed of propeller-driven aircraft. But we see an S-shaped curve here. Uh, you could look at a market. So if you're into architecture or you're into um, uh, real estate development, uh, this would probably be uh, the growth of new houses or new buildings in the Nashville area. And you can make projections about how this would grow over some period of time. I'm sure if people would believe that houses will be built forever and high rises in downtown Nashville will happen forever. But at some point, we run out of space. And so we could make projections about when that might happen. So with respect to cost of any good, installed base of something like houses or buildings uh, in a particular region, retail space available in Nashville will follow a logistic function. Uh, also substitution curves. Uh, here's, a sub, here's an S curve for cars. So around 1900 cars were invented and over the 10s and the 20s and the 30s, more and more people drew of cars. But as they did, they quit using horses for primary means of transportation. And so a lot of times when you think about uh, logistic function or S-shaped curves, as one grows, another declines. This is another thing that you might want to do uh, in your marketing. Sometimes we see series of S-shaped curves. This one is about transportation infrastructure. A lot of goods were moved via canals way back in the 1800s, but then the primary mode of moving goods was through railroads, then eventually roads, and then finally uh, through the air. And we're seeing that continue to grow. So there's a number of patterns that we see with trend extrapolation. It's not just fitting a curve through three points in some way that fits mathematically. It's about understanding the underlying mechanisms and picking the right type of curve to go along with it. Okay, we're on to our last one, scenario forecasting. Uh, another one, uh, I know this person, Kyle, thank you. Commercial roofing. Let's look at uh, the last forecasting method, which is scenario forecasting. Uh, on commercial roofing. All right. Well, I've already used up my solar cells on top of the roof. So I got to come up with a couple of other good ones. All right, commercial roofing. Scenario forecasting. Here's a quote from Seneca going back thousands of years this time. Whoever does not know how to take care of the future and the present will depend upon the uncertainties of that very future. And that really was the promise of today's webinar and of the program that would be developed through Vanderbilt Executive Education, it's one thing to predict the future, but we want to plan and prepare for it. So how do we do it? We take information from the monitoring forecasting method from Delphi and Trend. And we feed it in as the information that allows us to create scenarios, stories of the future that we can use for planning purposes. 
Scenario forecasting is a five-step process. Um, and here are the five steps. I'm gonna go through them one step at a time. Rather than uh, thinking there might be a quiz at the end where you're gonna have to know each one of the five steps and explain it, think about it this way. The, the purpose of me explaining scenario forecasting is for you to recognize that there is a very objective, analytic process that you can go through to start off with the world is crazy and there's a number of external factors that are influencing me and who knows what's gonna happen. And then move through this five step process one step at a time in a very methodical fashion to come out with a plan for the future, specific actionable recommendations you can take based upon these possible futures. So as you listen to me describe the five steps, just think of it as something that I could go through in a workshop something that somebody could take me through with respect to things I'm interested in, like commercial roofing or the hospitality industry or transportation or healthcare, moving from who knows what the future is gonna be like to I've got a plan for the future. The first step is factor analysis, recognizing that there are external factors that influence our organization. Uh, the, the mnemonic I use in my class is steeple, uh, that represents social, technological, economic, ecological, political, legal, and ethical factors. And what we do is we look at each one of those and say, how much will that influence our organization five or 10 years into the future? And we rate them on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is low and 10 is very, very high in terms of their impact. So if I was thinking about roofing, what social factors might influence roofing? Well, if it comes to things like um, uh, green energy, uh, having better insulation, solar power, there would be some social factors that might cause people to be willing to purchase uh, more expensive roofs if there was some sort of a payoff for the environment down the road. Certainly new technologies and roofing and materials, ways of getting them onto the roof less expensively, things that last longer, economic, ecological, political factors. I don't think there's a lot of ethical issues associated with roofing other than this effect on the environment. So I'd probably put ethical very, very low and I'd probably put technological factors very high. The next thing we look at are, is uncertainty. How uncertain is this future going to be with respect to each one of these external factors? Again, rating it from low to very high. And then when we multiply impact by uncertainty, we see its weight on our organization. So what you see here is six times eight is 48, 10 times eight is 80. And ultimately what we're looking for are the two factors that are going to have the greatest weight. In this particular case, which was for influencing autonomous vehicles, it could have been technological and legal issues. So technological and legal. We take those two factors into the next step and create four possible futures. So if we've got factor one, which is technological, and factor two, which is legal, we pick low and high forms of that factor. So technological, it might be with respect to autonomous vehicles, Cars are mostly like cruise control, but we got to keep our hands on the wheel. Maybe a high level of technological development is uh, the car can drive itself. In terms of roofing, it might be low ends of technological development. It might be current technologies, roofs that might last 25 years, um, that might get blown away in storms. And at the highest end, it might be something very low cost that lasts for 100 years uh, and is great for the environment and reduces um, cost of energy for uh, heating and cooling the home. Uh, with respect to any other factor, it could be legal issues, it's illegal or it's very legal. What we look at is the interaction of those two levels of the two factors to create scenario one, two, three, and four. Four possible futures. Now these are very divergent pictures of the future. So sometimes it's very, very good news, sometimes it's very bad news, sometimes it's just really unusual. The economy is gonna be great, but social factors with respect to hospitality, um, don't, people don't wanna get out and about. We take one of those scenarios in the workshop and we say, let's pick one that you think is most likely or one that you think is most dangerous or one that nobody's talking about. And we move forward to step three. We do a SWOT analysis. So many of you with MBAs or have taken a business class know about the idea of looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that come from helpful and harmful factors that are either internal or external. So just do your standard SWOT analysis and then you take the information from that and you do what's called a toes analysis. That's where you map strengths to opportunities and that's where your obvious natural priorities are. This is your bread and butter. This is the business that drives what most people do in the workplace. If you look at your weaknesses, organizational weaknesses in the future against the opportunities that might exist in the future, these are potentially attractive opportunities. And for people like you who are tuned in, 
might be interested in creating some new initiative for your organization. And similarly, you can look at strengths and threats, weaknesses and threats as things that you have to defend and counter. And some, especially if you have weaknesses, are potentially high risk. Oftentimes when I work as a consultant, this is what I do for organizations. I try to move things from this area up into this top left-hand corner of the quadrant. So that's a TOES analysis. And then finally, you take information from that TOES analysis and you create your action plan. You convert those ideas into specific actionable recommendations, sentences, create goals. You prioritize those recommendations and there's a variety of ways of doing that. You could use impact or effort. You could use Eisenhower's urgent, important grid. There's a variety of ways of doing that. Uh, but please recognize that the plan that you just created, this last action, uh, action plan, only relates to that specific scenario that you picked. You can, with a bit more time, go back through and for each of the other scenarios, create action plans for those. And this is the outcome of the workshops I run with my graduate students. Um, they can, with a blank piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, uh, with 60 minutes on the clock, start with their uh, environmental analysis that, you know, looking at those external factors, uh, producing some scenarios, justifying the selection of one, moving over to create a SWOT analysis, a TOES analysis, what we sometimes call a strategy matrix, and then finish up over here with specific actionable recommendations. Now, if you want extra credit or this is something that you'd like to turn in, you can turn it into a report that looks like this. And this would really be the outcome of a program of the type that Dave and his group put together. You come in with ideas about your industry, about technologies or things that you're interested in. And we walk through these different forms of technology forecasting, in this particular case, scenario forecasting. And you walk out with a specific plan that you can use for a possible future. Now, what I've talked about are different forms of forecasting. And I'd like to wrap it up by saying, how do you combine these forecasts? Well, each of the methods that I've just described, meth, uh, monitoring, Delphi, trend, and scenarios, takes different forms of information, qualitative and quantitative, which gives us a better well-rounded view of the future. When they all produce the same types of conclusions, this means the report you have and the recommended recommendations associated with them are gonna have greater credibility and confidence with the decision makers within your organization you can actually combine the results of several different forecasts if they vary a little bit. And one way I thought would be interesting to describe to you comes from the idea of PERT planning. You may have heard of Gantt charts, PERT charts. Um, it's really about creating a probability distribution. And here's an equation for you again, won't appear on the midterm exam. But if you wanna take a combined look at the different forecasts that have come, some will be optimistic, something's gonna happen very, very soon. Some will be very pessimistic, it's not gonna happen for 20 years. And some might be, uh, your best guess for instance, is it's gonna happen in 10 years. Well, you take one times your optimistic estimate, one times your pessimistic, you add it together with four times your most likely, and that creates sort of a bell-shaped curve. You divide it by six, and that creates the best estimate. And this is a way that you can quantitatively combine the estimates from a variety of different methods. Okay, I think we're at our last polling question that as we finish up here is launched to you. Which forecasting method do you think will be most useful for strategic planning in your organization? It should read organization there if it's not on. The purpose of this question is to just get an idea of your appetite for different types of uh, forecasting methods and will help inform how we build out a program. So, we see some responses coming in. Monitoring, Delphi, also known as expert opinion, trend extrapolation, or scenario development. I'm gonna be curious to see what the results are, Dave. Alrighty, and we'll stop it now. Be right at you're wait. killing me. <laughs> I know. I want to build 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 some anticipation. You are, I, get a, you are. I want to I want to get a number. Okay, fifty eight percent scenario development. Oh, interesting. Commanding um, Leonard with forty six percent, followed by trend extrapolation, Delphi, and monitoring. Yeah, and uh, that's actually a really uh, a great result. Um, 
when I teach this course at the grad level or how I would teach in the, in the uh, program you're developing, Dave, we would start off with monitoring just to collect a lot of information. Some of the information you collect are who experts are. You could do a quick survey via email or using internet, um, uh, some shareware applications to do a Delphi forecast. Trend is where you can actually start to take that information and start to make projections quantitatively. And again, feeding all of them into that scenario development process that I just described produces a final result that takes the best pieces from all those that were combined uh, from before. So that's okay. actually a really, really good result. Yeah. Um, great, so we're on our last slide. If you wanna, how would you sum it up, best sum up today? Sure. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Walter Gretzky, the father of Wayne Gretzky, hockey legend. Uh, he was, as many parents are, the coach of his son or daughter uh, from a very early age. He told Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. And so really the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce you to the idea that you can make predictions about the future. You can make predictions about where things are going to go and you can start skating in that direction rather than chasing whatever is happening today. By the time you catch it, it's already moved on to something else. And you'll always be one step behind, whether it's with your professional uh, organization that you represent or even your personal career. This is what I tell my students. The great thing about technology forecasting is you can make predictions about where the world's gonna be five or 10 years from now, and you prepare yourself, prepare your organization for that possible future, and you'll be in the right place at the right time. Terrific. Thank you, Andy. That was, uh, for those of you uh, joining for the first time, that was almost a semester's <laughs> worth of content in about 27 minutes. So uh, the purpose of today's webinar was actually to expose you to some of our programming and actually to test uh, the, the, the commercial viability of this for those of you out there. So I posted into the, um, the chat function a survey. We'd like you to take it right now, um, if, you, if you can, please, based on what you saw. Uh, or before you leave at the end of Q&A. We're Vanderbilt, we're keen on getting, being relevant, having relevant, transformative, personalized learning. So please uh, click on that link before you leave um, today. Um, so again, thank you, Andy, that was great. We've got about 15 minutes left. I, I thank you for sort of mentioning, we are in development of a program, uh, potential program, and you mentioned aptly that if they come to a program, whether it be virtual over the course of a week for a couple hours a week, or potentially in person at the beginning of next year, assuming we come out um, of our phases. Um, the intent is to arm you with some, uh, some true thoughtful um, models to help your organization. So you could potentially leave this program with a, a promotion, director to VP of technology foresight, perhaps. Um, so questions, pop your questions into Q&A if you would please. I've already had a couple that I've looked at. Um, both Kathleen and Andy asked, um, are there any systems to make sure that the selection of the panel of experts is not biased in the Delphi method? Again, are there any systems to make sure that these, these experts aren't biased uh, in and of themselves? Yeah, you know, that's really challenging because uh, we as moderators have biases of our own, right? So, and what really represents or who is an expert? Uh, I think what you can do is use what's called snowball sampling or the idea that where you can talk to some experts and say, who would you recommend to be on this panel? Let's see experts pick other experts like themselves, ask them to pick a diverse range of experts. Make sure to pick experts that come from uh, wide ranging fields, right? So if you're doing something in healthcare, pick people that are also from other, think about your board of directors, how you sometimes bring in people from other complementary forms of business. Uh, the good news is even if they're biased a little bit, if you have a large enough group of experts their biases through that concept of wisdom of crowds have a tendency to uh, cancel the, each other out. That's where the, the anonymous questionnaire approach also helps. Terrific, okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Salazar, thanks for your question. He asks, what book or video would you recommend as a reference tool that captures scenario forecast? What book or video would you recommend as a reference tool that captures scenario forecast best? Yeah, that's one of the more um, commonly used. So if you were to hire some company to come in uh, and have them do uh, forecasting for you, I will bet you uh, eight times out of 10, they're gonna use a scenario forecasting approach. 
Uh, it's a very common sort of workshop approach. Uh, Jay Ogilvy, O-G-I-L-V-Y, and Peter Schwartz are some of the individuals who have done the most um, work uh, going back way back to Dutch Shell Oil and the Delphi method. Um, so if you type in scenario forecasting and you Google that, you look for those names, you're gonna find some pretty good references on that scenario approach. The five-step approach I described today is a little bit of a consolidation of a couple of different approaches. I've tried to simplify it a little bit. Um, so rather than having eight steps, we only have five. Um, so you're not gonna find exactly what I'm presenting in those other sources. Uh, that's something that's exclusive <laughs> through Vanderbilt University. Um, but look for those names and look for those terms and you'll find some uh, relatively recent and I think relevant literature. Terrific. Uh, Richard Magnonia, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Richard, asks, what are emerging approaches to technology forecasting? Yeah, emerging. Yeah, so there's there are really more than 100 of different approaches to technology forecasting. And I've picked four that are really the most common. Another one that you might add to the list would be modeling. The idea that we can actually, with trends, start to understand the mechanisms that underlie what's happening. And so if we want to make predictions about global temperatures or about the spread of COVID-19, we would use mathematical uh, models based on physics and chemistry and biology to do that. Um, there are a number of uh, organizations that are taking a form of Delphi uh, and making a little bit more modern prediction markets that allow lots of people to come in. I think any new method of technology forecasting is just going to be some sort of an iteration of the ones that I just described to you, but using technology to help you do it better. One approach is using artificial intelligence to do that uh, monitoring for you. You know, with all those information sources, it's like drinking out of a four inch fire hose, just too much. But there are a lot of organizations that provide technologies. Um, think about a super advanced Google alert system that can look for information that you want, consolidate it and present it to you. So any new method of technology forecasting will be some technologically enhanced version of the things I've just described today. Okay, well, we got 10 more minutes. We got a couple more questions. Keep coming in. Uh, AJ, do you think there's super forecasters in technology prediction? Could it be better to find and focus on the super forecasters, like a, they have some sort of superpower, for sure. their trend predictions rather than a panel of other experts? Yeah, you're looking for somebody with a cape or no capes. Uh, as it would be. Uh, you know, there was, a, I saw an article about a year ago talking about um, a group that had asked people to make forecasts and they watched the forecasts as they came in and they were trying to find the person or persons who are the most accurate in their forecasting thinking somebody's got some form of a latent database, a way of thinking about the world that allows them to be a better forecaster than somebody else. Uh, my suspicion, and, and for some of the students who are tuned in, or students of mine in the past who are tuned in, great to see you online. Um, you'll know I'm a pretty skeptical guy. And I think that idea of finding a super forecaster that way might just be uh, kind of a, a biased sampling strategy. You know, the person who got them right a lot in the past may not be the person who gets them right a lot in the future. I think a super forecaster, to answer your question, AJ, is going to be the person who uses methods as I described here in a very systematic approach. They're gonna be the ones that bring their uh, constituents on board early, make sure they understand their questions and go about the forecasting in a very uh, methodical fashion to create transparency in the process, which allows the decision maker to have greater confidence in the results. So I think a super forecaster is one who does their job in a very objective, systematic, repeatable fashion. Terrific. Um, Jose, I'll get to you in a second, but there's an ancillary question that's uh, sort of the opposite of a super, a super uh, <laughs> person. Can creation of advisory boards serve that purpose? Basically an assemble of a diverse mix of ep expert opinions. My, my take on that is um, it depends on your N, your sample size, how big that advisory board is, but, right. but that's my bias. What's, what's again the question, can creation of an advisory board serve that purpose? Yeah, you know, I'm skeptical about advisory boards. Again, Kathleen brought up earlier the idea that you might have a biased advisory board. You know, it's very common for people in leadership organizations to bring in people who are like-minded, both with what they believe and how they kind of approach the way they think about it. Um, what I want is a, a group of individuals who, again, uh, bring in systems of thinking. So they can have diversity based upon their uh, knowledge base, diversity based upon their methods for analysis, but I buy into conclusions when I understand your sources of data, 
your methods of analyzing it, right? Uh, and, and how you present the results. So I think I would be careful about advisory boards, especially if you bring them together face to face, you will have those focus group issues, which Delphi was expressly invented to resolve. Great answer, not what I was expecting. Oh. Um, so thank you, Al, um, or excuse me, from Jose's, Jose question, he's been waiting patiently. Are you familiar with the Millennium Project and the future research methodologies? Uh, I am not. So this is a great idea. Uh, Dave, you said this is just like my class. Many times in my class, I'll say, you know, I don't really know that much about it, but I, I promise you next time we get together, uh, I'll do some research on it and I'll share what I know with you about it. I think actually I've heard of it. There are a number of organizations for futurists, futurologists, people that are interested in the things that we're talking about today. Um, there's a number of organizations that are collections of individuals. They've got great websites, great resources. They run conferences. I think this group does that. Um, and so if you're interested in knowing more about this, certainly you can participate in the programs that Dave and the Vanderbilt Executive Education or look for these organizations like the Millennium Project. Okay, um, your technology went out there a little bit, but we're, you're back now for a second. Okay. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, first of all, Richard makes a mention, there's a book called Super Forecasters, which is yeah. a description, okay. And then he, he also mentioned uh, in response to the question that was asked about advisory board, try a nominal group technique as a method for dealing with advisory boards that is more practical than Delphi. Um, yeah. So thanks for that, Richard. Uh, yeah. We're all about learning here and we learn from the 150 or so that were on this call. Um, Priya asks, how could you use technology forecasting to advance forecasting towards food systems or epidemic forecasts? How could you use technology forecasting to advance forecasting towards food systems or epidemic forecasts? Yeah, the future of food is really, really interesting. In fact, years ago uh, in this course, I taught also at an undergraduate level, uh, there's a company called Beyond Meat. And many, many of you have probably heard of this idea of plant-based proteins. Um, and so we actually had a taste test in our class where I got a whole bunch of those Beyond Meat hamburgers. And we went to the Vanderbilt cafeteria and tried out some regular hamburgers, see if you could tell the difference between the two. Um, there's a lot of work that's being done uh, in the production of food. Uh, and its distribution, not just in the United States, but around the world. And, and there are, you could apply every one of these forms of technology forecasting to food production and distribution to reduce waste, um, create healthier diets, um, and prevent or reduce starvation. So great ripe area. Um, any of these techniques would really work for that. Uh, certainly with respect to epidemics or pandemics like we see now, trend forecasting is super powerful, right? Um, but again, what is your source of data? Um, what are your methodologies for analyzing it? What are your assumptions? And I think that's why we see a lot of these predictions about uh, are the numbers going to continue to rise? We see a two-week lag between um, how many cases are in the hospital and how many deaths are there. And this is difficult for most people to understand. And so it's the people with the tools and the understanding of exponential growth or exponential decline or the idea of lagging indicators trend forecasting would be great for economics and pandemics. Then looking at, just Dave, if I can add one more thing, um, trying to figure out how the public responds to what's happening. That's where other techniques that are more qualitative that you might use, um, like monitoring what's happening in other countries, Vanderbilt monitoring other universities, or Delphi asking experts to take a look at how public perception might be shaped by what we see. So again, these complementary approaches to technology forecasting could be applied to both examples, Priya, that you asked about. Thank you, Priya, for that. Um, Andy, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide, we're coming up on our last minute here. Uh, any, any of those who joined today have any questions about our programming? There's our website there uh, with contact information. Kate would likely be running the, or will be running rather, the short program we talked about today. If your company is interested in custom programs or on any of this, contact me and then we've got a great resource um, about 60 hours of online programming, reach out to Paula. Um, we've got a minute left. Um, Andy, any, any closing remarks as we, uh, as we wrap it up today? No, Deb, I just wanna say thank you for the invitation to talk with those folks who tuned in today from the Nashville area, other places in the United States, and I think we have a few international uh, viewers. I know that we work through this content very, very quickly. As you said, Dave, this is a semester's worth of information, or really it could be a career's worth of information kind of plugged into a short format. It, technology forecasting like the game of chess 
you can learn the rules relatively quickly, but you could spend the rest of your lifetime mastering it. Uh, I hope those that uh, heard about what we're talking about today in technology forecasting, planning, and preparing for the future uh, are now interested in learning a little bit more. Some of the resources we talked about as we went through the presentation are great. I know, Dave, that if um, you were able to offer this program through Vanderbilt Executive Education, uh, I think we could put together a great program so that students would learn how to use these particular methods, apply it to areas of personal and professional interest to them, and be able to make some really good, solid predictions of the future to allow them to plan and prepare for their own lives and the uh, future of the organization they belong to.